Hello and welcome to Contact Centre Showcase and the special edition of Lessons from the Lockdown. Um, Rod Jones, your host for this afternoon. And our guest is Simon Danzig, all the way from the UK. Hi, welcome, Simon. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to join you, Rod. Thank you for having me along. Excellent, thank you. And for our viewers, uh, Simon is a, a strategist in uh, business and politics and business intelligence, a former member of parliament in the UK and Chairman of London Downtown in Business. Uh, Simon, just explain to us briefly, what is London Downtown in Business? Uh, I believe it's a business networking group, but please expand on that. that that's exactly right, Rod. It's, it's a business club. Uh, downtown in Business was established uh, 16 years ago by a good friend of mine, Frank McKenna. He's the chief executive. Uh, started it in Merseyside, and then it grew and covered uh, Greater Manchester. Uh, then into Lancashire and Cheshire, all these different parts of the United Kingdom, now become very strong in the West Midlands. And uh, there are networks in each of those localities, uh, bringing companies, businesses together. But also, it's exceptionally influential in that it, it then marries those groups and organisations with politicians and senior decision makers within that locality, and indeed nationally. So it's, it's a very well-connected network, and we've just uh, established it in London as well. Uh, so we're just grow, growing it in London and creating a network here. And uh, Frank very kindly asked me to be the chairman of the uh, London region. So that's what I do, bringing businesses together, connecting with politics, uh, helping you know develop policy uh, that suits those organisations. Very interesting indeed. So perhaps once uh, COVID is over, we'll come visit and uh, see what it's all about. Um, then you have a, a, a personal interest in BPO, Global Business Services. Um, just for our viewers, I met Simon at the Bapesa conference in uh, Durban in um, November it was last year, when all things looked different. Uh, your interest in BPO, where, what's, what does it stem from? Yeah, it's interesting how we fall into these sorts of uh, topics and sectors, isn't it? Uh, I used to, before I went into politics, uh, before I became a member of parliament, I had uh, a research agency based in Manchester, uh, and, and we had a call centre uh, as part of that, a CATI unit, computer-aided telephone interviewing unit. So we do very many uh, surveys uh, from that unit. So I have an initial sort of background in uh, call centres. We outsourced some of that to Egypt as well uh, to deal with capacity at the time. Uh, so I certainly got a feel for BPO and, and contact centre work then. Uh, but more recently, I've just taken an interest. I have a keen interest in uh, customer service and customer engagement. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of grown into taking a, an interest in helping uh, companies identify which call centres and contact centres are more suited to them really. So working from the UK, but as you know, uh, better than probably anybody, uh, this is a global sector uh, that's uh, particularly well by places like uh, South Africa, uh, India, the Philippines, etc. So uh, yeah, so I sort of have grown into the sector in many ways. Well, the sector's privileged to have you part of us as well. And if we just cast our minds back, it doesn't seem all that long ago, towards the end of last year, end of 2020, uh, through December, January, I think we were all quite bullish about the prospects for accelerated growth in BPO and global business services. What was your view pre-COVID of the world of customer, ex customer experience, customer service? And that yeah. made spin particularly on the UK. Yeah, I, th I think, uh... I think it needs, within the UK, I think there's a real need for some businesses to get better at customer service. I think that was uh, pre-COVID, pre the pandemic. Uh, and I think the pandemic has really accelerated that issue, really. I think it's really shown some businesses to be weak in, in regard to customer service and customer engagement. Some have done well and they've flexed and they've pivoted as they say nowadays and, and, and dealt with what's been thrown at them by the pandemic. But some companies, some large household names, banks, uh, some of the airlines have really struggled to deal with customers. So what we've seen with the pandemic is it accelerates some of the issues uh, that have come to the fore in terms of uh, customer care. And I think there are some real lessons to be learned about that. 
Well, I think this is one of the angles that we'd really like to probe on a little bit. Um, based on your experience over the last, what, two months perhaps, um, um, focusing on the UK, what lessons do you see coming out of this that business uh, should really take cognizance of and, and apply to any future strategic thinking? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you asked as well, Rod, about what it was like pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there was, as you know, uh, sort of a gradual shift to, towards more home working. And when we met in South Africa in November, you know, I met one or two companies, uh, contact centre companies that, that specialised in home work. You know, I did a little bit more of that than perhaps other businesses. That's now been accelerated, hasn't it? My own personal experience of dealing with businesses here in the UK, there's seen that uh, some companies have uh, uh, moved to home working. Uh, and so that's been accelerated. There's going to be more of that. There's a lesson to be learned there because many of those companies have shifted to, uh, to home working, haven't been ready for it. They don't have the technology to be able to do it efficiently and effectively. Uh, so there are lessons to be learned there in terms of how, how well uh, contact, contact centre staff are prepared for home working. Uh, I think there are lessons in terms of business continuity. So whilst everybody says, you know, these are unprecedented times, nothing like this has happened before, it's almost inevitable that something will happen again. Uh, so I think businesses need to think about where their contact centres are based and probably the right solution from a business continuity perspective is to have a mixture of uh, onshore and offshore so uh, so that they can flex and pivot as and when uh, something happens whatever it might be and they can you know because the pandemic is a great example isn't it because across the world we've all been coming into this uh, and coming out of this pandemic at different times uh, so having uh, facilities and support in other countries would actually work quite well for many of these large uh, large brands and I think in terms of business continuity uh, angle, I think that's something that they need to learn from uh, from, from this pandemic, I think. Right. And um, then in terms of the, uh, the reaction of customers to the pandemic, the customer service, um, my observation has been that in the first few weeks of lockdown, um, general customers were fairly um, relaxed about the fact that agents are working from home. But uh, in South Africa, we're starting to see those customers becoming as demanding, if not more demanding, than they were pre-COVID. So on the one hand, we have um, some flexibility, um, which is now being clawed back. Um, do you see something similar in the UK um, in terms of customers' attitudes towards customer service from a a remote uh, agent service point of view. Mm, I, th I think uh, I think people are probably more relaxed about uh, whether the person responding to them is onshore or offshore. I think I suspect that that's the case, particularly when when there's a crisis such as what we've been living through. Uh, I think there's probably been a shift towards more online activity, but again, some large businesses certainly in the UK, have struggled to meet demand in that respect. They can't get the websites right. Uh, the online chat doesn't work efficiently and effectively. So it's really, I think, what the crisis has shown, as the pandemic has shown us, is where some uh, companies have uh, succeeded and where some uh, have failed. And, you know, that will cost them dearly in terms of revenues uh, going forward. Uh, from this pandemic, there are people, you know, customers who are quite clearly saying, I will not be using that business again. And all of that is down to customer care, customer, customer engagement. So those businesses that have done well around this, who have had offshore facilities, who've uh, not just doing phone, but also doing online and uh, engaging in various ways with their customers, uh, will, will do okay post pandemic. It's those that have, have really failed their customers who, are, who I think are going to be punished, who are going to struggle. Well, that takes us to uh, the, the point where we need to gaze into a rather murky crystal ball uh, in the post-pandemic pandemic, um, scenario. Uh, 
when that is, is anybody's guess, but assuming that towards the end of 2020 into 21, uh, how do you see the world of customer service, outsourcing, BPO um, in the post COVID environment? I, th I think uh, I think we'll see a shift towards more online people. People don't necessarily want to speak to someone, you know, uh, they just want to engage uh, via their computer or tablet or, or phone. Uh, so I think that will inevitably grow. I think it's been given a boost by this crisis. Uh, I think there will be a greater demand uh, to use offshore. So I think places like South Africa, as an example, are ideal locations. Uh, for UK businesses to, to look at offshore in two, uh, not least because uh, there's very little time difference between the two countries. Uh, the education system is exceptionally good. Uh, the exchange rate is, is advantageous to the UK. But you've also got the infrastructure and uh, as a country, a dedication towards customer service. So, uh, you know, in terms of all those countries that sort of, whether it's India, Philippines or wherever else, you know, there are real issues for some people in the UK around uh, where the call is handled from. But as we go more online, that will be less important. But nevertheless, I think South Africa, India will still be at the top of the tree in terms of, uh, you know, delivering these types of services. And I think that's set to grow. Um, another interesting point that's been raised is the... <sighs> The issue of impact sourcing, social responsibility um, in the new world. Um, do you see the COVID having accelerated some of that strategic thinking, that uh, business with purpose, um, social Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this actually, Rod. I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity there because if co companies are going to outsource, if they are going to go abroad, then why not, uh, you know, see, see it as an opportunity to have some sort of social impact. Uh, I was particularly pleased to be able to visit the Arambi project in South Africa where, where, in last November. I have a, a long history of having examined and worked around uh, employment initiatives of various kinds over the years, both in, in uh, research terms and in political terms. And I have to say that uh, that particular project is probably one of the best uh, employment initiatives I've ever, I've ever uh, engaged with and, and, and seen in action. And why wouldn't large corporates who are looking to outsource, which they inevitably need to do for the reasons we've just described, not least in terms of business continuity, yeah. why mm -hmm. wouldn't they then want to have social impact and engage and use impact sourcing, as we call it, uh, to have an impact and provide some of those services. I think it com makes complete sense. So I can imagine uh, the smarter businesses that do outsource will want to have a social impact as well and will engage through uh, organisations and companies that really can help have an impact. You see social um, investment or impact sourcing um, as a almost a precursor to the outsourcing. Uh, before cost savings, um, do you see it as a priority above cost savings, or cost savings being the primary driver? Well, we, yeah, uh, well, we we dealing with large corporates, and uh, the bottom line is always what's uh, crucially important. But I, but I don't, I, I mean, I don't know the econ precise economics of these things, but I suspect that you know. I think there's an efficiency around this anyway. I mean, you know, I don't think it comes at a, a much higher cost to use impact sourcing. Uh, I think, you know, these are smart organisations like Arambi, uh, you know, that are engaging uh, younger South African people, giving them the skills that are required, uh, bringing them into the uh, labour market and giving them a real hand up as opposed to a handout yeah. and i think it's incumbent upon corporates to you know to identify that and, and see the opportunities and really capitalize on it and i think there's also a role for government you know i have a background in politics uh, we often talk about international aid uh, you know giving money to uh, countries that uh, developing countries well how that's spent we want it to have a really positive impact and I think, you know, impact sourcing could be a, a real marriage for international aid in terms of how, how uh, governments 
in wealthier countries like the UK, but in America and others, uh, can have a real, you know, uh, effect in other developing countries through impact sourcing. Um, yeah, I, I think it's already starting to be talked about that this sort of support uh, is not a handout, it's the investment with an ROI which comes back ultimately to the, to the source. So uh, interesting to see how that's going to pan out in the years ahead. And as we wrap up, one or two points that are highlighted in your mind as the, the stuff that businesses should have learned from this. You mentioned uh, disaster recovery, etc. Anything else that you'd like to stress as the lessons should be sort of written in stone now that we don't repeat this? Yeah, I think flexibility is, is the key word. And that's about having the technology that enables you as a business to be more flexible. Uh, I think that's been crucial. I think uh, uh, also in terms of offshoring, so that, uh, that already having that network in place to be able to move and react from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, this is a truly global economy. So I think flexibility, having a global perspective on what's going on, I think they're the two key issues that corporate businesses, large companies, really need to take into account and, and and perhaps thirdly you know keep an eye on the customer look after the customer when all these things are going wrong and when we're in the middle of a crisis customer comes number one simon thank you so much for your inputs and your your insights and for sharing this with us today and uh, we wish you well and be safe and uh, and uh, stay out of uh, harm's way in uh, great to join you rod uh, Rather testing times for all of us. So thank you so much once again. Thank you.